be with you, brothers and sisters. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday service. And, well, this morning we're just two days away from, from the new year. And uh, although the weather might not tell you that, uh, if you look outside, it does not look like in two days it's going to be New Year's. In fact, if you are on the road yesterday, you would have realized that it's easier to use ice skates than your car to get anywhere. Um, but maybe we'll have a white New Year, hopefully. So the passage that I would like to read to you today uh, is in the book of Psalms. It's the first, uh, first chapter of Psalms. Verse 1 through 3. It's in the very beginning, and in fact, it's the introduction to the book of Psalms. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now that's a very good introduction to the book of Psalms. And God has allowed us to see yet another year. Um, we've truly been blessed because it's not what we have done throughout this year, it's what God has done. Not a single thing from our hand could have pushed us through this year. Some have started new businesses, some, ad some have advanced in their careers, um, maybe finally received that degree. Others got married. Some became parents, and some for the second, third, fourth time over. What a blessing. But let's not for one second forget who's been guiding us through this year. He's answered our prayers. He's established our path. He's healed us. He's restored us. He's prepared us. And most importantly, he died for us. Brothers and sisters, we've truly been blessed this year. But think back, maybe at around this time last year, maybe you were thinking back on the year before. You were thinking about what you did right, thinking about what you did wrong. Maybe think about, thinking about what needs to change for the upcoming year. Maybe you had some New Year's resolutions in your head. Things like maybe spending a little more time with family, putting your work second. Or maybe it's quitting a bad habit, whatever that may be. Or maybe it's cleaning the garage and making sure the garage actually stays clean. That's the one that I always struggle with. Um, maybe you actually wanted to use that membership that you've been paying all year for. So what is a resolution? I'm sure you've heard that word just about everywhere. And around this time of year, it gets used quite a bit. So what a resolution is, it's a firm decision to do something or not to do something. It is looking at your life and deciding that I need a change because I decided that I need a change. Well, if you look back at the beginning of last year, or beginning of this year, how did those decisions go? I know not everybody makes these huge decisions at the beginning of the year, but even, even in other times, how did those big decisions, those firm decisions of you trying to do something with your own strength how did that go? Maybe, maybe some have succeeded, but I'm willing to guess most made it last a few weeks, flailed, and then it died out. Why is that? Why do our decisions from our own strength, why do they die out? Why do they not last? Because that's what resolutions are. They're self-willed, self-imposed, and self-propelled. There's a lot of self in that, don't you think? There's a lot of Strength that we draw from ourself. We get the knowledge from ourself to make these decisions. And then we think that things are actually going to work out and this decision is going to last. So this topic, again, comes around New Year's all the time. But we make these kind of decisions all the time. We make changes, or at least we do our best to try to make changes. Because a lot of the times they don't last. We do them based on our own knowledge and our own understanding. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad to decide that you need to spend more time with family. It's not bad to decide that you need to spend less time at work and to focus on other things. It's not bad to decide that you need to keep up with your health. The problem with a resolution is that it puts all the work into our hands from start to finish. It's not a good formula. This resolution leaves God out of the picture. 
And I know the two might sound similar, but they're different. Resolution and a revelation. What we need is a revelation. A revelation will bring about change because of what God has done. A revelation, is, it contains God's plan and his will for you. So how does a revelation come about, and what is it? Well, it has to come from a spiritual source, God. A deeper understanding and knowledge of God is something that we all need to strive for. It was A.W. Tozer that says, what comes to, mind, what comes to your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Brothers and sisters, I tell you, this is, this is very important because whatever comes to your mind when you think about God dictates every action you take after that. If we think about God as our friend, our buddy, JC, we'll treat him as such. We'll treat him as our friend, our buddy. Sin won't affect us. Sin won't have a damaging effect on our life, we'll just go about our lives. We'll think that everything's okay. Jesus Christ is my buddy. He'll save me. If we stick with God as love, we're missing so many facets of the true Godhead. We miss out on the true nature of God, and we settle for a God that we feel most comfortable to worship, the God that we want to worship because, hey, God is love. If we see him as a cosmic police officer, well, he's just itching to give us a ticket, right? Our lives, were, our, our lives will reflect that also. We will follow all the rules. You, we will do everything that is necessary. But it is not because we love God. It is because we are so terrified of receiving a ticket. I was stuck in this phase for quite a bit. And I think I was not alone. My parents taught me all the rules, and I thank them for that. But I believe that that was the extent of the faith. It was hard to realize that I've just been following the rules instead of following God. And it wasn't until I got to know him personally as my savior that he revealed himself through his word, through prayer, and through other people, that I had a personal relationship with him. And things actually began to change. So the world tells us that God is love, but he's also wrath. It tells us that God is, or the Bible tells us that he is the God of justice and the God of peace. His, not, his likeness is not something that we could ever truly comprehend. It's not for us to know. We're so weak that even, as much, as, even so much as a glance would certainly kill us. That is the God that we worship, and that is the God of this church. Brothers and sisters, I pray. Pray for God to reveal himself to you through his word, through other people, through the people in this church, in ways that you've never seen him before, because that is the revelation that will change your life. The first time I heard of this prayer, it scared me, because I thought of the cost. I thought of what would happen if I knew God, even for a glimpse, even a little bit of what he truly is, not just the cosmic cop that needs me to follow the rules, but if I knew him for his love, for his mercy, for his justice, if I, know, if I knew truly who God was, I wouldn't be able to step back into my regular life. I would need to change. So if that's something you pray for, God will answer it. I think for the most part, people, are, people generally just do their best to stay on a good path to steer in a good direction. It's a lukewarm faith that keeps us comfortable and feeling like, well, I did something. I you know, pitched in my part. I was afraid to pray for something like that because I was afraid of what God might do in my life and that I would have to give up these things that I've been so comfortable with for so long. I was afraid to pray big. And I think I'm not alone in this. Has anyone seen genuine thirst before? I think in America, genuine thirst and hunger is hard to find. Um, I think I speak for all of the younger generation that we've never seen something like that before. I'm, I'm sure the older folks have. Um, maybe after running around for a while or a hard day's work with, with no water, maybe that's something 
you have seen, genuine thirst. A few years ago, I saw something that changed my perspective on what that even looks like, because I had no idea. My friend and I were climbing a mountain in Colorado. It was an 18-mile round trip, so nine miles up at 14,000 feet. Uh, most of Minnesota is 800, 850, 900 uh, elevation, so it's not very hard to breathe, but at uh, 14,000, it is very hard to breathe. Um, and this trip pretty much took all day. We both had our own supplies, and we were able to reach the top. Uh, when we got there, we noticed that there was a few others that have already made the, the trek, and they're already up there. So we began to socialize with them. Uh, not long after, um, another man came, and he had these two big water jugs strapped to his backpack. And we welcomed him, and we began to socialize with him. Um, he told us where he's from. Turns out he's from Minnesota, too. There was a lot of people from Minnesota there for some reason. Um, but uh, we began to socialize with him, and he uh, introduced himself, told us a little bit about him, and uh, mentioned that, uh, oh yeah, I have a friend coming. He was, he was slowing me down, so I decided to just keep my pace, and uh, I made it up. He should be here in about half an hour. So I was like, wow, this, this guy must have been actually pretty slow for his friend to just ditch him like that. My friend and I were surprised that he would leave him, but uh, a while later, uh, his friend did actually make it to the top. Um, he didn't introduce himself. He walked past everyone and grabbed one of those water jugs. Turns out, the friend that left him behind had all the water. And he left him at a point where he couldn't go back because he didn't have keys to the car. His only option was to keep going forward in hopes of maybe getting some water at the top or maybe catching up to his friend. And the thirst that I saw that day was unlike anything I have ever seen. That is the thirst that we need for the Word of God. When you thirst for Him, we scour the Scriptures and we find out and we pray for Him to show who He truly is. This is a prayer that God will answer and you'll realize that once you have the correct view of God, once you truly know who he is in our mind's understanding, I'm not saying that you'll ever get to a point where you'll truly know like, all the facets of God. That's not something for us to know. But once things get into focus, once you see him for who he is, for what he's done for you, resolutions, your decisions, your veiled attempts of trying to fix your life seem so small, so stupid even you'll realize how silly it was for you to try to change something in your own life. Your decisions will be small because you've had a revelation. God has showed you truly who he is, what he's capable of, what he can do. Your vision has come into focus and being around bad influences like we read in the beginning of uh, the book of Psalms, being around those bad influences won't entice you as much you'll see that these are not the people that God wants me to be around. It won't be because you decided that I don't want to have these influences. Things will come into focus, and God will show you that too. Because if you spend time with wolves, it's only a matter of time before you begin to howl yourself. You'll delight in the Lord and his written word, just like the second verse says, not because you have to or because your parents made you or you know that that's what a good Christian does, but because that is his word to you. It won't be just an ancient book sitting on your lap. It'll be God's word directly to you. The last one's a big one. You will bear fruit. The fruit example is used quite a bit in the Bible, and we all know what happens to a plant that doesn't bear fruit. We look a little bit closer in the third verse. We see that the trees will be planted. You'll be like a tree planted near the river. This is important context because a vibrant tree is always the sign of life in the Old Testament and in the New. A tree cannot plant itself. That tree cannot uproot itself from a bad place, around bad influences, around weeds, and put himself into a place where there is water, where there is nutrients, the things he needs, needs to be planted, not something it can do on its own. And then it will prosper. It is the work of God. should never be considered our own works because he is the one that puts us there. So for this coming year, brothers and sisters, pray big. 
ask for God to reveal himself to you, to reveal his character, for you to know him for who he is, not for who somebody else told you or what you read about somewhere else or what your friend might have said about him, but get to know God as your own personal savior. He will teach you and reveal his character so that you have a personal relationship with the Father, a living, a living and vibrant faith, and it will bring forth fruit. I'd like to stand and pray.